You know, we did, but we didn't. We were kind of taking it as it came. Uh -huh. We were writing songs and working on parts, and um, you know, Mike and I, Oz, kind of put together the dual uh, harmonized solo mm -hmm. thing, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I was busy, you know, trying to do drumming differently, mm -hmm. like turning it sideways or doing some of the other ideas with drum sets I had at the time, and. Mm -hmm. And I think the harmony thing just kind of happened. I mean, Oz, Oz is a great singer. I remember hearing him sing at school when he was in chorus class, and I'd walk by the door and I'd see him, and I'd, I'd be over here rehearsing with PT Express on drums, and I'd walk next door, and I'd see him singing, and I'd think, man, he's a great singer. And uh, then I saw Timmy sing when he was in Stormer. And of course, I already knew how Michael sang, but I don't think we realized that, you know, when we formed it and put it together as Rock's regime at the point later to be Striper, how the the three part harmonies would come well, to be. Well, not only that, they they have the perfect range, vocal range too, and they they have such a good blend. Now, I don't think it was an accident. They have a perfect blend, and you know, actually, I wanted to sing, and I can. Yeah, I, I, know I you wanted can. to do that, but I I would run out of, you know, I would lose my voice from breathing so hard from playing drums. Well, of so course, hard. of course. So it was difficult for me to you know do the drumming thing and and try to sing. I probably really should have tried it, uh -huh. but uh, I wanted to leave myself open to to really be able to put everything I could into the drumming at that point. I saw that was, you know, and I, you, and I, you know, so many people like you so many drummers follow you so many people look up to you so many just like they do to Oz and Mike and Tim but um, you know I know sometimes fans get overzealous and they do things like you know call in your hotel room at five o'clock in the morning or or uh, or call in your house at three or four in the morning and please don't do that <laughs> Is that how you feel about it? I've had a lot of overzealous stuff. I've come home, I've found a girl or I've got on the oh bus my and gosh. I had a girl in my bunk. I've Remember when you lived in uh, uh, Buena Park, uh, a girl went slept on your front porch all night? Uh, that's happened like 30 times. I've had fans come out from another state or another country and knock on my door and me open it up and then say, I'm here. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with that? You know, and I've never wanted to hurt anybody's feelings. And I mean, I think Striper has some of the greatest fans in the world. I really do. Uh huh. But that stuff gets a little scary. And I, I've, oh, yeah. had, I've had a lot of scares, you know, with people sneaking in, in houses I've lived in or, you know, waiting by my car or other things. But that just goes with it. That's part of it. You know, other people have that too. Uh, a part that was scary to me was when we had the office in Buena Park and some people lived there and you were one of them because it was like a 4,500 square foot place and uh, you would be pulling in the garage and then these people would be walking up the driveway as the garage door was going down you know do you, re you remember those days? I have a bunch of stories of course I have a bunch of stories I could tell you but um, I'll, I'll give you two I'll try to make it quick I, I came home one night when we were recording uh, songs I uh, I, I think it was for the beginning or rehearsals for In God We Trust, I think uh -huh. is what it was. Yeah. And I pulled up like at two or three and I saw someone standing down the side of this limo length garage mm -hmm. and, and a cloak and a hood. Oh boy, that's scary. And the car lights hit him and I remember I, I had a time where I could pull in that garage and hit the brakes and slide in the garage and have the garage door coming down real quick. So I did. And I actually had a pistol in the garage, so when I jumped out of my car, I had a 45 with me immediately. And I had this very strange, eerie feeling, and I, I, I went running upstairs, and I locked the double doors that I, were on my bedroom, and I'm looking out the windows, and I just I got this terrible feeling. And the next day, I went in the backyard, and someone had carved a pentagram and the golf course right behind our backyard and you could walk from my backyard into the golf course and there were some dead birds around it and it looked like there was blood 
Ooh. poured on it. So Ooh. it it was not a joke. It no. it looked like a real serious thing. So I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best to put a stop to this. So I took a bunch of slices of plywood, nailed up nails through them, and put them upside down in the ivy. Um, we had about three feet of ivy you had to walk through to, to, to get over to a lawn. And the next yeah. day, I went out and checked on the nails, and someone had stepped on it, and there was blood on, oh, wow. on the wood. <laughs> but that house was beautiful, but there were so many scary things that happened there. During the daytime, it was wonderful. Yeah. But at night, it took on a real eerie oh, I know. vibe. And the house was stunning. I loved it. I lived upstairs with a couple of my drum techs and a few friends, but downstairs was the striper office. And the other thing that really stands out, and there were there was a bunch of them, believe me, that was the heyday of all the craziness going on. Right. Um, some of the stories you still don't know what happened, but I know I was sitting on the front porch writing the words to "In God We Trust," having a cup of coffee like at eight o'clock in the morning, and yeah. I remember saying to myself, "What a beautiful day!" And right as I said that, I'm looking out in the street about a hundred feet away, and I see a guy about six six walking sideways. So I'm sitting over there, and his face is this way, and he's walking up the street, but he's taking a real slow. Uh, stepping real slow, okay? Yeah. And instantly I knew something was wrong. And right behind him was a lady that was maybe f uh, maybe four or eight. She was real short, but I remember she had a straw wig on, and I could tell it was straw. And And I'm looking at it, it was only a couple seconds, but it seemed like time slowed down, and I felt evil. And I really know what evil feels like. I felt it. And this guy, his face whipped around and looked at me, and he bolted straight towards me. Uh huh. And he came running up the walkway. Uh -huh. And I remember getting up out of the chair, and it felt like slow motion, like, get out of here. Uh -huh. I didn't have a weapon on me. I had, you know, this guy was huge. He was like a giant, and he was running right at uh -huh. me. And right as he got to the steps, and I was ready to open the door to get in the front door, my two cousins, Donnie and Jeff, threw the door open. They saw him come running up. And I think it saved me that day, I really do. I think me and this guy would have ended up on the front porch in a fight. And that house was so big, I don't know if any of you would have heard it because you were off on the other I side know. of the house. It was very scary. Well, come to find out, I talked to the police and they broke out of the Norwalk Mental Institution. And it made their way up into this neighborhood, which was hard to find if you knew where the house was. Yeah. So the fact that they got into the Los Coyotes golf course and made it all the way up there. Wow. Right as I'm writing the words to a God we trust. Right as I'm writing them down. The very first day of me writing that song. I feel like that was kind of the devil's way of like, yeah. I, I, I don't want these lyrics written. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't want Rob to write these. But I finished them up after they were taken away. Yeah. That's just one of some of the spiritual oh. things that we have experienced. I remember when I was Striper's manager, sometimes I would be working so much that I time would get away from me. And everybody would go home or the people that lived there would all be gone. And I would realize, that, hey, it's 8.30, 9 o'clock at night and I'm here all alone. Yep. And I always felt like I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here now. Well, yeah. when I lived there, that's how I felt. You know, I mean, I was touring a lot, I was recording a lot, and rehearsals a lot, but when I was there, there were times I'd be there for a month or two at a time, a couple weeks here and there, and I would realize, wait, everyone's gone. I gotta get out and of here. Just strange stuff happened. Strange and you, feelings. And you didn't really put it together because the house was so beautiful that it didn't seem like anything like that could happen there. But a couple of nights I woke up hearing bottles smashing or breaking and I would run downstairs with a gun in my hand and the back door would be open and I would be thinking, how did they get the back sliding door open? And by accident they would hit a bottle or something on the counter and it would be on the floor broken. Oh yeah. And I would be thinking that probably just saved my that life. That saved your life. Yeah, a lot of scary stuff happened there, and that's why I ended up moving when I did. I know. But I was still in the Lost Coyotes Golf yeah. Court. So. Yeah, you were. Well, yeah. how did you hook up with Enigma? Um, 
Your songs, let me let me elaborate a little bit on yeah, that. We're, we're backtracking. Your now. songs were recorded and they didn't have Christian lyrics. And then something happened. Your lyrics were changed and Enigma didn't mind. You used the same tracks with new lyrics and it all blended and worked together perfectly. So tell us a little bit about that. If I'm remembering correctly, and I think I am, it was 1983. And uh, a good friend of ours um, that owned Cosba oh, um, yeah. recording. John Willoughby? Uh, no, oh, no, 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 no. Chaz? No, it wasn't Chaz. His name was John. And uh, John Saint uh, something? Uh, it could have been John Saint. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Now, he's an awesome guy. Forgive me. I'm really terrible with names. Yeah. but. He, uh, he said, you need to check out Enigma and the Hein brothers they own it. They're really great guys and are really, we would go in and do a lot of recording, you know, $100 uh -huh. here, 50 bucks here, and walk home with a, a reel in our hand going, you know, and it was such a big deal to us. Uh-huh. A really exciting time, and um, I said, okay. So I had a cassette of Loud and Clear, and I went down to Enigma Records, and I, I remember walking in, and they were celebrating Aleister Crowley's birthday. And I knew who Aleister Crowley was. Wow. And um, I thought, wow, this is so strange. Why is it on the day that I walk in? I mean, I don't care, but isn't that amazing, the timing here? That's kind of scary. And I walked in, and I, I remember I talked to Wes Hine. It was super cool. And I just said, listen, Wes, I, I don't want to take up your time. you you got a great place here, but I really think we're supposed to be hooked up with you guys. And... I think you're going to like the band. I've got a cassette with one song. It was loud and clear. I said, if you could give, give it a listen, I know we're going to do business together. And I, I know you're going to want to sign us. We're going to want to work with you. Give me a call. And, you know, after you hear it, he called the next day. And um, we hooked up with him. We, before that, we went to Geffen. David Geffen wasn't interested. Uh -huh. And I'd always really had high hopes of, you know, yeah. hooking up with Geffen. I heard nothing but fantastic stories about Geffen at the time. But your songs didn't have Christian lyrics when Enigma no. first heard them. No, they didn't. Um, you know, and the transformation of Striper was still moving forward, and and we had decided, okay, the music is, is what we do, but we're going to change the lyrics. And, you know, that's a pretty big deal. That's it is. pretty gutsy, even when I think back about it, to be playing the clubs and doing the things full-on rock and roll. It wasn't like Christian bands back then playing churches. We, this was full-fledged rock and roll with all of a sudden in-your-face Christian lyrics. So we got the deal. We went in to do the first record and roughs were sent over to Wes and Bill and they heard the lyrics and they went, um, wow, what's with the Jesus and the God stuff? <laughs> The music's the same, it sounds great, but... The lyrics are all changed. They're changed. And we told them, well, this is the direction we're going, and, and they said, well, it sounds great, so we'll release it. That was kind of cool of them, too. You know, yeah. they, were, they were a great label, and um, they were truly behind you. Yeah. They were these guys that just had faith in what we were doing, and, and I wish there were more labels like that. They... You know, and I'm sure we're gonna we're doing a deal that's with with Frontier, and I'm I'm sure they're gonna be the same way. Yeah, that that's the label you're getting ready to sign with. Right, now. right. But you know, back then these guys really trusted us. They really believed in us. They said, "Okay, it's you guys' vision. You run with it." And I really always appreciated that. I, I used to go down to the label like once a week and we had little meetings. Okay, where do we go from here? What's the next record called? What yeah. do you think it's going to sell? What are we going to do? And it was a real special time. It, it really, really was. It really, really was.